Well, it's already been a very encouraging uh, time to be with all of you and again reconnecting with a few more people uh, tonight that I hadn't seen for a while. Um, since becoming a Christian, God has put a lot of good people into my life, uh, people that have encouraged me with words that I needed to hear at uh, the time that I heard it. Uh, I've understood now what true family is all about. And uh, in the different places that I've been, there's been people that have made large contributions to my understanding of the scriptures and God. And uh, there's a lot of people here tonight that I would count among them. And so it's a, just a blessing to be a Christian and uh, to have the community and, and the, the love from one another that God has first shown to you guys. Um, so far, the preacher feedings have been very good. Thank you for that. Uh, look forward to the other ones as well and having more meals with you guys. <laughs> Um, these first three sermons in this series, uh, we're dealing with different pictures of what our purpose is in the Bible, and last night we looked at uh, Mary and tried to look at some things from maybe some perspectives that we hadn't thought about before. And what was scheduled for tonight was to talk about a text in Luke 14. I think this is the only lesson that I'm going to switch from what the, uh, the advertisement said. <clears throat> when I think about... Um, my purpose as a Christian. One of the passages that, that I always think about is this one in Ezekiel 47. Very picturesque, very vivid. But at the beginning of the Bible, there is a river that uh, subdivides into four, and Adam and Eve are told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, to cultivate the garden seems to be the idea. And one of the things that was going to give strength to that, that mission that Adam and Eve were given was, I think, this river that was flowing out from the Garden of Eden. At the end of the Bible, there's also a river that gives healing and nourishment to the nations. And in the middle of the Bible, there's another passage of a river, and that's this one in Ezekiel 47, which sort of in some ways connects what we saw in Genesis 2 with what Revelation 22 says. And this is a prophecy or a prediction I think, first of all, of what Jesus was going to be and do, and the expectation of what God's people are supposed to be and do. Before we read this text, though, I want to show you something that I've thought about recently with the book of Ezekiel. Uh, it might come as a surprise to hear the number, but in the book of Ezekiel, there are only four visions. There's a lot of times where Ezekiel gets a really picturesque kind of thing that he'll share with the people. But there's only four times where he's actually taken in the Spirit and he sees different things that then he re relays to the Israelites. And in each of these four visions, I don't know if this is intentional or not, it, or if it's just one of those cool coincidences in the Bible, but the four visions of Ezekiel summarize the whole story of the Bible. The first vision in Ezekiel chapter 1 opens up with the vision of the likeness of the glory of God. It's not even the full glory of God, but it's the likeness, and you've got the wheels within wheels and all these things that we don't have time to talk about. But the main character in the Bible is God, and he's the glorious one. He's the one that we have sinned against. In, in Ezekiel 8 through 11, you've got the second vision. When Ezekiel is brought into the temple complex, and as a priest who would have been working at the temple, this would have been a very frightening vision for him. But he sees all of this idolatry that's happening in the temple. So this defection against the glorious God, so man is left in sin. The third vision is the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37, where God takes these people who are dead because of their sin, and the son of man, Ezekiel, who's called son of man in that text, comes, and he breathes these words that give life to these dry bones. So God is glorious. We've defected against him. God, in his grace, sent the son of man to speak words of life to us. And the final vision is Ezekiel 40 to 48. And this is a picture of the restored temple. Now that man has been given life again because of what God has done, this is what God's dwelling place was always supposed to be. This is the perfected temple that does not have any idolatry in it. <clears throat> and um, what we're looking at tonight is what you could say is perhaps one of the climactic parts of this vision of the restored temple. 
After Ezekiel sees all of this glorious temple, he takes a step back and he sees this river that says a lot about our mission and about our purpose. Let's go ahead and read this text in Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south gate side. Going on eastward with the measuring line in his hand, the Son of Man measured a thousand cubits and then led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again he measured a thousand and led me through the water, and it was waist deep. Again he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass through, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. As I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so that everything that lives, uh, lives where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea from Engedi to Enaglaim, and it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. And on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail. But they will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for the food and leaves for healing. Uh, let me say something about the background of Ezekiel and who he is as we look at this vision here that he is experiencing. At the beginning of the book of Ezekiel, we learn in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1, that Ezekiel was taken into exile when he says, As I was among the exiles by the Kibar Canal, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Now, from what I've read, if, uh, maybe if you got this on a map or something like that, the Kibar Canal would have been along the major roadway that the Babylonians would have left to and come back into. It's along that roadway. And Ezekiel's been taken into exile, and uh, he was taken in the second of the three times when the Babylonians came and, and plucked people away from uh, Jerusalem. And what Ezekiel is doing in this book is he, he reminds me of, if you ever watch an NFL game, when... Uh, People are trying to see what happened in the play, and the guy, the referee, goes to that booth to determine what the, the answer to the play is going to be, and he comes out and he gives an answer that makes people sad or happy, depending on what side you're on. I take it, like, I imagine Ezekiel being like this guy who's with a bunch of other exiles, and he has to go and, like, commune with God or get a vision from God, and then everybody's wondering, okay, what's he going to say about our homeland? Because is it going to be that we're all going to return quickly? Is it going to be, like, what's it going to be? And here's Ezekiel, and he keeps coming back to the people and saying, this is what the Lord just told me, this is what the Lord just told me. We're a long ways away from our homeland, but uh, I'm like the prophetic news anchor here. The message of what Ezekiel is telling these people in the first 32 chapters, is just judgment, 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 judgment. That, hey guys, we've messed it up. Uh, we had these abominations in the temple. We had not been honoring the Lord. We were people that, like in Ezekiel 16, we were given life. We were this little girl left on the side of the road for dead, and God gave us life, but we cheated on him. He's giving them all these pictures, but the book then in the second half or the second section talks about restoration. That God is going to judge the wicked shepherds and leaders of the nation. Uh, he's going to do the valley of dry bones thing where they're going to be brought back to life. So the, these are the two main sections of Ezekiel. And in both of these sections, there's some things said about the temple of God. 
the first half, like we said earlier, has got this vision of the temple that's filled with idolatry. And in that text, in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 18, it says, Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. Here's God packing up his bags, and he says, Because you guys have been committing idolatry in the dwelling place of God, and by the way, if we're the dwelling place of God and we've got idolatry in our hearts, guess what he will do? You read Ezekiel 8 through 11, and it says like in chapter 8, verse 6, he's getting ready to leave. And then there's something else like here in chapter 10 that he's about to leave. And then in chapter 11, he finally does vacate. And it's because of their wickedness. Now, the second half of the book, in this vision that we're looking at, it climaxes and ends in Ezekiel 48, verse 35, by ending with, the Lord is there. So if in the first vision of the first temple... You've got God vacating. You've got the book of Ezekiel ending with God returning. And what Ezekiel is seeing here in Ezekiel 47, I think, has to do with what does God want to accomplish in this place now that he dwells here? What is it that he wants to do for the world? What is it that he wants to do in your life? What does that say about our purpose? And I got a visual for this. Um, I, I found this to be a helpful picture to imagine what's happening here. You imagine that Ezekiel is brought to the entrance of the temple and he sees that there's water issuing from uh, right around here rather than exiting by the east gate, which is the Lord's gate, and I I think somewhere in Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel leaves by, by, uh, oh, sorry, by the east gate. He exits by the north gate and comes around over here. And he sees that this little trickle of water that just seemed so small has gotten a little bit bigger as he goes outside the temple. And there's this uh, angelic figure or something like that that tells him to go uh, 1,000 cubits or 1,500 feet. You imagine Ezekiel, is, is, he's walking, 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 and like the water's becoming deeper and deeper, like ankle deep. But how did it ever do this? Because this is an arid region where the water would normally like sink down into the sand pretty quickly or the dirt pretty quickly. But for a second time, uh, the angel tells him, go another 1,000 cubits or 1,500 feet, and now it's becoming knee-deep. So now it's becoming a little bit harder to walk. And ima- imagine Ezekiel going, I've, what, how is this even scientifically possible? A third time he's told to go, and it becomes waist-deep. So he's gone a mile now, and it's becoming very, very difficult for him to make it. He's told to go again, and for the fourth time, it becomes this... Uh, uncrossable torrent of water, so deep that you can swim in it. Now, did you notice the question in verse 6? Ezekiel is seeing all of this water, and how is it all doing this? And in verse 6, God asks him, son of man, have you seen this? That's a good question for us to ask. Have you seen this and what this means? Now, I, I imagine that as Ezekiel, like, lifts up his eyes and and looks out, he sees very many trees, uh, trees that are bearing all kinds of fruit. And I imagine maybe him squinting his eyes and he looks a little bit further and he sees that all of this water is entering what the text just calls the sea. Which sea was so well known that was to the east of the temple that doesn't even need to be specified down by the Arabah? Well, this would be the Dead Sea. Uh, I was, uh, when I went to San Diego last week, and uh, my son and I, Asher, and uh, we went in, in the uh, ocean, and he was doing boogie boarding and learning how to do all this kind of stuff. Uh, he was born in California, so he has to know how to do that. And so um, he was talking about how much salt was getting in his mouth. From what I've read, it's 3.5% of ocean water that has salt and minerals in it. 3.5%, that's it. The Dead Sea is 35%. This is a place that cannot sustain life. It's not a place that can give life at all. In fact, when we were flying into San Diego uh, last week, I looked out on the plane and I saw uh, the Salton Sea. Did you know that California's got its version of the Dead Sea? The Salton Sea. And when I lived out there, there were some some churches that I, I would preach for from time to time where I had to drive past this place that's both ugly and beautiful at the same time. 
Uh, there's like abandoned cities all around this area, like places where there used to be hotels. It was a big vacation spot. But then a bunch of minerals and all this kind of stuff from the farmlands got into it, and there's some other legends on what actually happened there. But it's just a place nobody can live. If somebody was to tell you that the Salton Sea is going to be retransformed into a place where it's not just dead fish bones all over the place, but there's actually fish living in there, and this place has become a place where people uh, are vacationing, and there's all these very many trees that are able to give uh, good food to people, you would say that that's just impossible because this place is so dead. In this case, this trickle that comes from the temple has re totally rejuvenated this place that nothing could give life to. In fact, do you know what other stream of water constantly comes into the Dead Sea? The Jordan River. All the time, and it never transforms it. But this, from the temple, is somehow able to transform it. Did you notice, by the way, in verse 11, that when Ezekiel sees all of this, that there are still swamps and marshes, and that they're left for the salt. Now, i got two ideas on maybe why those are there. I'll say one of them at the end, but here's one idea, possibly. Maybe those swamps and marshes are there for the salt because the sacrifices needed salt accompanied with them, and you need to find a place to find those kinds of things. This is part of the imagery of the temple. Maybe that's it, but maybe there's another reason that we'll get to in just a moment. But if this is the scene that Ezekiel sees... What, what does this have to do with Jesus? What does this have to do with us? I want to say, first of all, that this, this is a foreshadowing of Christ. And that when you think about what this trickle of water is doing, this stream of water, when you think about the source, the direction that it's going, and the manner in which it flows, there's some really powerful lessons that we can learn from this. Think, first of all, about the source of where this water is coming from. In verse 1 and in verse 12, it's emphasized that it's coming from the temple or it's coming from the sanctuary. In other words, this water that gives life is coming from the dwelling place of God. Um, Jesus in the New Testament in John chapter 2 would compare himself to the temple. In John 2, 19 through 21, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. If the picture in Ezekiel 47 is you've got the temple that has this river that flows from it that gives life to all kinds of things you'd never think it would give life to, the picture is, is that Jesus is the source of all the deepest things that you need. He's the one that gives you meaning. He's the one that gives you satisfaction in life. He's the one that gives you hope. He's the one that gives you all of these things that nothing else ever could. Do you live as if all of the blessings you need flow from Jesus? We're, we're, we're in church right now, so that's what we're supposed to say. But does your life throughout the week really demonstrate that the things that you're seeking after to learn more about and to grow in, does it reflect that belief? So that, Okay, so you see... Jesus is the source of this life-giving water, but notice the direction of the flow of the water. Where is it flowing? Towards the east. And in the Old Testament, remember whenever people sin, they're always like heading east. Adam and Eve are evicted to the east. You got some, some things with Cain and Abel and, and Cain and where he has to go and things like that. Like the question in the Old Testament about the temple was who could go up into that temple and that's the high priest once a year that can go most fully where the Wi-Fi signal is. That's how I imagine like the presence of God. Like the outer courts is like the Wi-Fi strength is pretty weak. But then like in the most holy place, that's where it's the strongest. So you'll never forget that now. Um, anyways. Uh, there's only one guy that can go in there once a year. Here in this temple, it's the blessing of God going out. So the question is not who can go in, but now it's going out to things that are dead. Think about Jesus' earthly ministry. He spent time with tax collectors. He spent time with sinners. Think about in uh, John chapter 4, the woman at the well, married five times, shacking up with a sixth guy, 
and she's going to a well at a time of the day where nobody went to the well, perhaps to be by herself because of the social shame she would have had if she was there when everybody else was. Maybe that's the case. And Jesus comes to her and talks about giving her living water, this imagery that I can quench your deepest thirsts. He would flow to somebody like that woman, but what does Jesus do in the chapter right before that? With Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel. This man that Jesus says, you have to be born of water and spirit. In these two stories, he's using water imagery and he's flowing towards these people and showing them, I've got things that you need. Uh, how many of us have refused the direction of the flow of God's blessings? Uh, some of us might have been people that before we were ever Christians, we seemed pretty good, like pretty good people. Other of us may have come from more rough backgrounds. All of us need Christ, but sometimes in our pride and in our ignorance, we don't think that we need what he has to offer. Sometimes we can think like, well, you know, maybe this flow or this stream, maybe the Jordan River is going to be what I need, and it's never going to transform you until one day what happens to you is the same thing that Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I remember, I was thinking about this the other day um, when, I was, when I was baptized, and when I was there was a guy in Bowling Green that was just baptized on Tuesday, and we were talking about when we were converted and all that kind of stuff. And I, I distinctly remember driving to the church building um, and just crying that there would be anybody, let alone a, an infinite God, that would love me and, and know everything that I've ever done, but still want to give me forgiveness. Do you remember the moment that you let that stream come towards you and the joy and the satisfaction and the quenched thirst that you had because of that? Jesus would go to the tax collectors and sinners. Now, we're going to say more about that as it applies to us in just a moment, but notice another component to this. The manner of the flow of the water. It started out really small and it became very, very, very large. Nobody could have looked at that trickle of water and said, hey, in one and one-third mile, what do you think that that trickle is going to be like if you couldn't look out on the horizon? Like, the, the scientists would have said, well, it's just going to go right in, and, and the geologists would say the same thing, and the meteorite, or the meteorologist people, whatever. All, everybody, all the experts would have said, there's no way that that's ever going to become what you think it might become. And when Jesus came on the scene, like we talked about last night, he was born of a virgin that had no historical significance until the angel Gabriel appeared to her. Jesus never wrote a book. Jesus didn't do international travel for his work. He largely stayed in one kind of area. He started his kingdom with 12 common, uneducated, ordinary kind of people. If you were to see Jesus with his 12 apostles, and they were like walking down a road somewhere, and they walked past a Roman military outpost. And somebody asked you, hey, what do you think is going to last longer? Those band of 12 people or that Roman kind of empire sort of business? Everybody would say the Roman Empire. But here we are today, 2,000 years later, thinking about Jesus, worshiping him, trying to learn more about him together. And it, wouldn't, it never started that big. So you see all of those kinds of things. Maybe one thing to say about that. What kinds of things are you impressed by? Are you impressed with all kinds of big, bombastic, earthly credentials? Look at how Jesus started. You never would have been impressed with him if the only kind of thing that impresses you are people that are really wealthy and really educated and really significant by earthly standards. We of all people should be the ones who are the most impressed by things that seem not very impressive. I'll say more about that in just a moment. But if all of this is a foreshadowing of Jesus, and we can appreciate that this imagery would all apply to him, let's take it another step and show that how this would also be a foreshadowing of Christians. As it says something about our mission and purpose, and let's ask the same three questions that we just did about how it foreshadows Jesus. What about the source of the flow? 
So we know that Jesus is the temple and the blessings flow from him. But did Jesus say anything in the New Testament about us being temples or a temple? Here's one passage that gives similar kind of imagery. In John 7, 37 and 38, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Where did the scriptures ever say that if you believe in Jesus, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water? I think Ezekiel 47 would be one of these kinds of pictures. But when Jesus says this, it's during the Feast of Booths. And during the Feast of Booths, uh, the Jewish priest would walk down to the Kidron Valley and get buckets of water and pour them out on the temple grounds. And on the last day of the feast, they would pour out extra amounts of buckets of water, all in anticipation that the blessings of God would be fulfilled. All the promises from the Old Testament would be fulfilled. They were anticipating these things to happen. And on that day, Jesus stands up and says, all of this leads to me. Um, and if you believe in me, you could just share in the same mission. Now, this means that one of the ways that we as Christians should think about ourselves is that we are like streams of water for those who are parched. We are the ones that, that have come to church and we've come to Bible classes and we're filled with all of this knowledge that if we would care for those who are lost around us, we've got things that can help them which shows something about the direction of the flow. If Jesus flowed towards things that are dead, what's our mission? To flow towards things that are dead. I think about the Christians in the book of Acts, that when, they're, when the persecution happens against them, and the Jewish leaders think that we're going to try to squash these people and get rid of all of them, when they, when they squash down on them, they just scatter and go all kinds of other places, continuing to preach the word. Uh, the same imagery is used also in Isaiah 32, verse 2, that God's people are going to be like streams of water in a dry place. So um, when I lived in San Diego, there was a guy at the church that had his own private plane, which is pretty cool. And one day he came up to me and said, do you want to ride in my private plane? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds cool. So I got into his private plane, and uh, he had property in a city called Calexico which is in California, but by the Mexican border. And if you cross the border, guess what town that is? Mexicali, because it's in Mexico, but it's on the border of California. So he had property in Calexico, and uh, he had to manage it and all this kind of stuff. So he would fly from Santee to Calexico, and I was up in, we were up in his little plane together, and I kept looking out the window, and it was desert, 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 bunch of farmland. And I asked him, why is there a bunch of farmland in the middle of a desert? And what he said to me was that in like the 1920s or something like that, that the Colorado River was diverted in, so that this part of the country can have some life-giving water and now there's all kinds of farms there. When you go to work tomorrow, wait, what day is it today? Is it Friday? It's Thursday. Okay, so when you go to work tomorrow or you go to school tomorrow or whatever you're going to do tomorrow and you're around all kinds of people that have got tattoos and you don't like that or they their hair's been dyed in ways that you don't like that either and they've got body piercings and you don't like that either and you don't like this thing and you don't like that how do you see these people around you they're thirsty they've been trying to get fed by the wrong streams and nothing's working your mission is to be flowing towards those that are dead which gets us into the manner of the flow you might, okay, so if our purpose is to try to help those that are perishing and dying and these kinds of pictures, well, the manner of the flow is something that starts small but gets bigger and bigger in ways that you would never anticipate. I think one reason that we get intimidated to try to live out our mission of being like streams in dry places is because, you know, who's interested? And it seems so insurmountable, and people have got so many questions, and I don't know how to answer every single one of their questions. How about this? How about we start with small things and see where those go? Remember in Mark chapter 6, when Jesus says, you guys feed the 5,000, 
and they go, we don't have the money to do that. We don't have this. We don't have that. We, they're thinking about what they don't have. And then Jesus' question is, what do you have? We've got two fish sandwiches. That's it. Okay, well, let, give it to me, and I'll show you what I can do with it. You know why some people become the kind of people that people go to for advice? They didn't just, boom, become that kind of person. It's because every time they needed advice, they asked for advice in small conversations, and they read things that helped them, and then cumulatively, they became people through their small disciplines that have added up to become somebody who's an elder in a church or to become a woman in a church that gives all kinds of advice to young mothers and people that are trying to raise their children. And th it didn't happen overnight. It happened with small things. What? Is there anybody that you can give a small invitation to? I love hearing people's conversion stories. And, and it, there's like little statements that people will just kind of throw out, like add to, the, to, to their story that are really interesting that you could pass over really quickly. Like, oh yeah, yeah, so I was invited to this Bible study and then we were studying the book of Acts and it was blah, blah, blah. And it was really, oh, you were invited though. Like, let's not pass over that little thing. Uh, somebody just asked you, do you want to read the Bible with me? Oh, we got this study already. Do you want to come to this sort of thing? Have you ever thought in, um, in the Gospels, there's times where people don't have um, much to say about Jesus, but what they say changes an entire city? Like in Mark chapter 5, you've got Mr. Gerasene Demoniac Man. And Mr. Gerasene Demoniac Man is begging to come back with Jesus, and Jesus says, no, you go and tell them what the Lord has done for you. Oh, okay. Hey, guys, I used to be demon-possessed. I had a bad case of demonism, and, and it was taken out of me. And then he goes to the next, I was a really bad demon guy. Look at my scars, and Jesus healed me. He goes to the next, and then the next time Jesus comes to that area, there's large crowds waiting for Jesus to heal more people. Or... Think about the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Have you ever thought about how simple her testimony is when she goes back to the Samaritan people? Come see a guy who told me everything that I ever did. Come see a guy who told me all that I ever did. And then the disciples who went to the Samaritan village, and the only thing they bring back is some food for Jesus that he doesn't even want anymore. They come back, and then Jesus says, look up and you see all of these people coming that guess who's brought to me? That Samaritan woman with a simple statement, come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Do you know what a small invitation can do? Things that you can't predict. Christians should be the people of all kinds of people that never despise small things. Imagine for a moment that I wanted to grow, um, what is it that grows from an acorn? Is it an oak tree? Okay, thanks. Let's say that I wanted to grow an oak tree right here. All right, so um, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take the, and I can only, I, I got to do something really cool and bombastic with it. So I'm going to take the acorn, and I'm going to start hitting it against the ground, and I'm going to dig enough, a big enough hole with the acorn, and then it's going to grow right here once I get it planted in there. Is that, no, it's going to shatter it. How about we dig a hole underneath with like a jackhammer, and then just place the acorn under it and give it 30 years? You ever gone on a walk before? and you see some kind of seed that's like breaking through the concrete? Because it started out small, and you gave it time, and it became something that you might not have ever expected it to be. I remember six months after I became a Christian, I was studying every week with Andy Cantrell. And the reason I'm the speaker this week, by the way, is because you guys couldn't get Andy at this time. Um, so... Uh, but Andy had said to me after six months of studying with him, have you ever thought about preaching? I said, no, I'm going into marketing. He's like, well, you should think about preaching. That one conversation has forever changed the trajectory of my life. Where I'm here now and I'm being such a big blessing to all of you. <laughs> so you, can you feel it? <laughs> what can one text to encourage somebody do to them? What can one card do? What can one eat? Things that you can't predict. So don't despise small things and just do the small thing and see what God does with it. Now, I said earlier that there were the swamps and the marshes. Maybe they're there because it's all, you know, a, 
a metaphorical picture of the temple and they need the salt for the sacrifices. But maybe another reason for this is that even though there's this amazing river that goes through and gives life to things and sustains life in things that never could have had life before, there's still going to be some people that want to be swamps and marshes. That they're in the vicinity of all of these blessings and they want to be like the stick in the mud. I'm fine. I don't need any of that. Is that you? Where you've got all of these things offered to you in the Lord. And, and every, every Sunday you come here and you see these blessings pass by you in the sermons where we talk about the love of God and what he wants it, and it just passes by you every week, every week, and you're just going to be a swamp and a marsh and not actually let Jesus transform your life. Don't be that kind of person. God wants to give you a mission and a purpose that's much greater than anything this life could ever give you. Tomorrow night we're going to look at another example of what our purpose is, but tomorrow night's going to be a little different. We're going to look at a counter example. We're going to learn from a bad example of what our purpose is. But thank you again for your kind attention. We're going to take a a break here, um, but I look forward to talking with you guys and spending more time with you guys these next few days. Uh, Great lesson from from Eric. What a a great picture about who we are, what our purpose looks like, and uh, I absolutely love using Old Testament imagery to communicate Uh, how God had a vision of how we were going to do things long before uh, you have Christ even coming. So beautiful pictures and really, really great. Uh, For me, the the lessons we've been talking about hope and um, I'm going to talk about how to have hope uh, when you feel empty. How often is life just frustrating, exhausting, uh, you, how often is life just like, really, or do, how many days do we have to keep doing this? Have you noticed how life is just simply a constant circle? Is that here we got Monday through Friday, and it's kind of the same old schedule, Monday through Friday, with us longing for the weekend that's going to be all of this rest and fun and relaxation, that you finally get to the weekend, and it's actually none of those things, so it's, suddenly it's back to Monday again, and boy, next weekend's going to certainly be better, and so we're, our hope is for the weekend, and we get to that weekend, and yeah, that wasn't really great either. Well, maybe it's going to be next time. And it just keeps being the, this circle, this frustration, this exhaustion of life that happens day in and day out. It's just the monotony of it all. You're up again. It's another day. It was like yesterday, and tomorrow's going to be the same. And we just keep going and going. The writer of Ecclesiastes speaks heavily to that picture. I love how you could open a book and just say, you know, everything is futile. It's just absolutely futile. It is just that. That's what life is, is totally. I love one translation that reads, perfectly pointless, everything is pointless. So that's one translation, that how it has it. And, and you can feel that in life where it just feels that way. What are we doing? It's just vanity. It's meaningless. It's, it's exhausting. It's futility. Uh, it, it, it is that pointlessness. And Sometimes you just kind of step back and wonder, well, really, what is the point? The way the writer of Ecclesiastes speaks of it, verse 3 of chapter 1, what does a person gain for all his efforts that he labors under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets. Panting, it hurries back to its place where it rises. Gusting to the south and then turning to the north and then turning, turning goes the wind. And the wind returns in cycles. All the streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are wearisome, more than anyone can say. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, the ear is not satisfied with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, what are we doing here? That is essentially how the book opens. It just keeps going on and on and on and on. And I want us to get a sense of how the writer of Ecclesiastes really does paint the picture of life being kind of a hamster wheel. 
I mean, do you not feel that way where you're just running and running and running and it's the same old, same old, same old, going, going, going. And that's what he says. You know, generation comes, generation goes. Sun rises, sun sets, sun comes back up again. Wind blows that way. Hey, guess what? Big surprise. It went the other way. And just here's just the essence of life as it keeps doing these cycles over and over again. This word that is, is given to us that Trans, you have all kinds of different translations. Some will say vanity or futility, um, meaninglessness, I think is what the NIV has. Pointless is one of them, as I pointed out. It's an interesting Hebrew word that is, is typically speaks of a, a breath or a vapor. But when the writer of Ecclesiastes is speaking about life as this breath vapor, I don't believe that his intent is strictly the idea like in James where life is transitory and just for a moment, but something a little bit more than that, that he's putting his finger on something really important, and that is life often just seems to not have substance with all of its pursuits. And I love how one scholar put it in trying to illustrate this idea of this word that is used to speak of futility or meaningless or, or vanity. He said, cotton candy is the imagery. And I was like, cotton candy? All right, bear with me. Cotton candy. You take a bite. For about a millisecond, you have a taste. And then somehow it's gone. <laughs> it just disappears. Strangest substance ever. Flavor that disappears in a heartbeat. And he says, that's what that word is getting at is that it seems like there's something substantial there, but as soon as you get to it, it disappears and it's gone. And yes, you had a taste of it, but it was really momentary, and it certainly wasn't satisfying. It was just empty. It just kind of vanished. That is the picture that the writer here of Ecclesiastes is painting about the idea of life. And so one of the things that I wanted to talk about is why is life this way, and how can we have hope in a world where it just seems like same old, same old, day in, day out, Monday through Friday, here we go again and again and again, so that we can be the people that God wants us to be in the seeming monotony and hamster wheel that we live in life. One of the things that I think is fascinating about what the writer of Ecclesiastes says and I think it is so foundational to moving forward in our understanding of why life is the way it is, is throughout this book, you will see that the author will say, God made life like this. He says it very early on in the book. In chapter 1 and verse 13, he says, I applied my mind to examine and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven, God has given people this miserable task to keep them occupied. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun and have found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I think it is so interesting that you see that the writer of Ecclesiastes says, God made it this way. Did you see that? They're highlighted in that first one. God has given people this. That God made the world this way. And you got to step back and kind of ponder for a minute. Why would God make it where it was frustrating? Where it had this emptiness? Where it had a seeming substance to it, but as soon as you latch onto it, it ultimately disappears. In fact, the concept of what that looks like is really interesting how he describes it. I found everything to be futile, highlighted on the screen there, a pursuit of the wind. Now, if you want to do something fun for your kids tomorrow, have them go in the backyard and tell them to go chase the wind and not come back till they caught it. They'll take great naps that day. You know, what, way to, what a way to describe life. It's like trying to catch the wind. Go for it. <laughs> Okay, perfectly pointless, complete futility, total emptiness, and God made the world this way is what the writer of Ecclesiastes says. And what is so interesting about that is in the next line he says, and what is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. In other words, and you can't change this. This is the way God made the world. This is the way that God made life. And you can't change that. 
It is made to be this way. It is made to have this emptiness, this lacking satisfaction, this pointlessness, this vanity, this futility. God absolutely made it that way. And if you try to make it not that way, it's not going to (laughs) work. You can try all you want to, but it's not going to get there. So I think it is interesting to get a sense of, of, of that picture. That here, everything under the sun, he says is ultimately a pursuit of the wind, and that can't be changed. These pursuits in life, and I think this is so important because you'll see that happen later on as he describes things in the book. One of the things of, of the book that is perhaps most famous, most renowned, is because Oh, let's see, let's do some math. 60-some years ago, there was a band that used chapter 3 and talked about how the seasons exist and for everything that happens in life, there's a time for it. You are always going to have life where it's constantly changing. There's a season in life where you're going to have sorrow, and then there's going to be a season in life where you're going to have joy. There's a season in life for birth, and there's a season in life for death. And he's just describing the essence of the ever-changing nature of life. It is constantly doing this to us, where you are having all of these moments in time that is constantly changing. In fact, after doing that, where he does a time for this and a time for that, for those first few verses, in in verses 10 and, and 11, he'll say, God has made everything appropriate in its time, putting eternity in our hearts so that no one can know what will happen next. Put it this way. God has made life with this emptiness that is fluid and constantly changing so that you have no idea what it's going to be like next. Just when you think you're going to bank on something to be a particular way, it's not going to be that way. I mean, think about how many times in your life have you thought tomorrow is going to go a certain way and it didn't even get close. He put eternity in our hearts. He's trying to do something to us to give a sense that there is an emptiness in the seasons of life, that as you keep running the hamster race and running in the wheel and keep thinking that you're getting somewhere, the seasons keep changing on you so that you don't have this lasting satisfaction. And God has come along and said, I made it that way. Now, there's some really good news about the idea of things being ever-changing and God making it where it's like seasons. Here's the good news. If you're having a rough time right now in your life, It's a season, and that's going to change. Here's the bad news. If you're having good times in your life, it's a season, and it's going to change. And I think that's an important picture that he's trying to draw out, is you can't put everything on this life and think it's going to be lasting, satisfying, give you what you want, give you what you think it's going to give you that that would be so satisfying that all of that time and all of that effort and all of that energy finally pays off. Ultimately, God is saying, I made the pursuits of this world to be unsatisfying. And so if you make it your mission to be happy by trying to pursue wealth, gaining possessions, being one of power or of reputation, advancing in your career, possessing wisdom, seeking justice, having a family, seeking pleasure, any of these kinds of pursuits, he says, ultimately are going to be unsatisfying. It's going to be like eating cotton candy. You're going to have a little taste for a moment that seems like you have something that instantaneously is going to disappear. Now, you might wonder, because I said I was doing a theme on hope, and nothing about Ecclesiastes ever sounds hopeful. It seems to be the most depressing book in the Bible, and it makes us all want to quit and go home. Why would we be in this book? Is this book ultimately hopeful? Well, one of the things I want you to think about in this is, here is, I think, the big picture of hope of what the writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to do. And that is, so when you have put in all of your time and all of your efforts to attain to something that you thought would be satisfying, whatever it was. And I'm not talking about sinful things, just anything under the sun. 
that you thought that was going to be your lasting joy. That was going to be the thing that would be satisfying. That was going to be the thing that was going to make you happy. That was going to be the thing that was going to change everything and make life all better. And you do that, and it doesn't satisfy. There's nothing wrong with you. You didn't do it wrong. God made life that way. So often what happens is we go, well, I was really pursuing my career and I thought that was going to be the end all and it, and it didn't work out. So the answer is I need another job and that's going to be the thing that's going to do it. Or I thought it was going to be my wealth, but it doesn't seem to be doing it. So the answer is I need to get more wealth and that's going to make me happy. Or, you know, well, I thought me being single, that's why I was unhappy. So I thought, okay, I get married and that's going to be the reason I'm going to be happy. Or I thought we were married and, 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 and not, if we have kids, now that's going to make it where we're going to be happy. Or if we just lived in another place, or we did another thing, or whatever it is. You keep becoming unsatisfied, and what God is saying is, I made it that way. There's nothing wrong with you. It's not that you did it wrong. It's not that, that you've messed that up. See, that's one of the tricks of Satan. The trick of Satan, he comes to you and he says, Oh, see, you... I know you thought you were going to be happy with a $25,000 car. You blew it. Should have been the $50,000 car. Next time, the $50,000, and now you're going to be happy. Or you thought it was that career. I know. I thought it was that. Change it and go and do this. One. Now that's going to be it. Oh, okay. Uh, if you just made more, okay. And so what we do is rather than stopping and saying, no, the reason why I'm unsatisfied is because these things can never satisfy. What we do is we often pursue it even harder. I need to push for it harder. I will work harder at my job. I will make more money. I will do more for my family. I will live somewhere. We'll, we just fill in the blank, and we're going to push harder at it. And the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, no, here's hope. When you feel that emptiness, that's supposed to be a trigger to you that your desire for satisfaction here is never going to happen. It cannot happen. So now let's take a minute in this. So why would God do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> you put us down here for X amount of years in which you are now directly telling us it is going to be completely unsatisfying, perfectly pointless, empty vanity in every way. So what are you doing? What it, why would you make the world this way? What is the big point? And so much of the book Ecclesiastes is trying to teach. So here are some of the big takeaways that you were supposed to have in life with the understanding that this life as it is given to us is not going to be satisfied. Some of the purposes that God has. Number one, I think is one of the beautiful pictures that you see in in uh, Ecclesiastes is in chapter 4 and in verse 6 where he talks about the need to learn contentment. He says there, better to have one handful with quietness than two handfuls with hard work and chasing the wind. You see what he's, he's getting at here. When you understand that life is not going to satisfy, the big question that arises is, so why are you reaching for these things that are out of reach? Because they're not going to do anything more for you. And here you are giving up what's in your hand, this peace, this comfort, this quietness, what God has placed in your hand, life as it is right now. And you're setting it aside and trying to think that your joy and your happiness and your satisfaction will be over here with two hands. And the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, we need to learn contentment. One of the big keys that this book gives to us, more is not going to make your life better. More is not going to make your life better. I bet I could take a poll of more seasoned Christians who are able to look back in their life and they can look back when they were younger and they could hardly rub two quarters together and say, we were happy. More wasn't what was satisfying. More didn't make life better. I bet there would be some people who would raise their hands and say, actually, more 
has given me more stress, more worry, more responsibility, more accountability, more difficulty. It's not a promise to us that, oh, more is going to be better. More is always better. But that's what our, our marketing in our society is. More is always better. That, that's what it has to be. And the, and the writer of Ecclesiastes wants us to stop and say, be content with what you have. To be content with what you have. Enjoy the handful that you have in your hand and stop straining for more. Now, the reason why he will talk about its importance is in just a couple of verses after this, he's going to make an interesting observation about the importance of people and relationships. I'll read it to you and then I'll, I'll comment about it. Notice Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9 when he says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm, but how can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Now, why would this be in this section about contentment, about holding on to the one thing you have in your hand and rather than reaching for two. And I submit to you that the idea is, is really when we lack contentment, we are so dangerous in how we destroy relationships and people. I, I cannot tell you how many times I have seen families destroyed relationships severed, friendships blown apart, because rather than being grateful for the relationships that are in the person's hand, we're far more concerned about pursuing the things of this world. And we are giving our time and our effort and our energy with the two hands reaching outward, chasing the wind, rather than enjoying the relationships that we possess. I also cannot tell you how many times I have sadly participated at the end of somebody's life of people that are Christians, at least were a part of our church, sat in the pews on Sunday and participated in all of that. And when it came to their time of death, there was not anybody who cared. I did a funeral about a year and a half ago of a, of a fellow who had come with us to church for a very long time. His wife died, and that spun him really out, unfortunately, spiritually, emotionally, for the last couple years of his life. And so one of the extended family asked me to do the funeral service because he had been a member of our group for such a long time. And I will, not exaggerating at all, in a funeral room pretty close to this size, there were three or four people who came, and they had nothing to say good about him. We just kind of read a scripture and prayed, because he had burned every bridge in his life in pursuit of everything else. He was not content. He didn't appreciate what was in his hand. He wasn't glad for what he had had. Instead, it was all about there had to be something more. There had to be more. There had to be more. And he destroyed everything in his life. And the sad thing is so often what we can be deceived into thinking is those people will be there later while I do this now. And that's a lie. They will not be there. Because you're showing them What's the most important thing? Your pursuit is the more important thing, not them. And there's all, always this idea of, well, I'm just going to, you know, forfeit some things right now, but I'm going to go after it. When I hit this certain level, then I'll be able to spend more time and focus on relationships and family and more time for God, and I'll be able to do all these things. That's a lie. Because you will burn everything down in the process. I'll show it a little bit more in the book later on. He'll say it specifically. But we need to watch out because what God is trying to teach us is that there is the need 
for contentment. And there is nothing sadder than losing the relationships. And that's what exactly the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying here. It's better to have two, better to appreciate what you have. Enjoy the people and the relationships in your life. Okay, so jumping toward the end, there's a lot of conclusions that the writer of Ecclesiastes draws. But I want to observe three big ones that he makes on a number of occasions that I think sum up the idea of why the world is the way it is, why God made it hopeless, here is his purpose in teaching contentment, and ultimately here are the three big takeaways that he wants us to get from this. Uh, I think in, in thinking about this sum of life, simple, basic, but please take it home with you and, and zero in on it. Enjoy life, to simply enjoy life. You might note that the writer of Ecclesiastes seems to say that a lot. Like in Ecclesiastes 2, in verse 24, there is nothing better for a person to eat, drink, and enjoy the work, and enjoy his work. I have seen that even this is from God's hand, because who can eat and who can enjoy life apart from him? For to the person who is pleasing in his sight, he gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and accumulating in order to give to the one who is pleasing in God's sight. This too is futile and a pursuit of the wind. I want you to notice that he says, there is nothing better than for a person to go ahead and enjoy life. When you have the understanding of how God made the world, then what you can do is appreciate life in its appropriate context. In fact, you'll notice he says, I've seen that this is from God's hand. You have to like that. He's not going up against God here. He's saying, it is useful to enjoy your work and eat and drink and enjoy your life. That is given to you by God. But here's the parameters. You won't enjoy life if you think you're going to find some kind of lasting meaning and satisfaction in it. But if you can appreciate it for the cotton candy that it is, now you have it in its right frame. That, yeah, we have possessions. It's not worth striving for with two hands. It's not worth burning down relationships. It's not worth being discontent over, but it is simply a blessing of God that we are allowed to enjoy. Put in that idea family, put in that idea career, put in that everything about life, to put it in that context. When you make it the end all, it's an idol. When you make it an end all, you won't be satisfied, you'll be discontent, you'll be unhappy, you'll be empty. But if you enjoy in the parameters in which God gives it, where he says, you see, this is my blessing, you see that I'm giving to this to you as something to enjoy, then now you can enjoy it the way God wants you to. And so what I would ask you to do then is to simply enjoy life as God has given it to you, not what you want life to be. We noted earlier that the writer of Ecclesiastes said, What is crooked cannot be made straight. And we can spend an awful lot of our time trying to make our life something that it is not and cannot be. Rather than receiving where we are right now, we're discontent with it and we want something out there. I wish that we could make life what we want it to be. I came to you last year and talked about my situation with my daughter and her special needs and the issues we're having and the difficulties we're having and the difficulties right now. My wife's texted me the last two days going, uh, it, I may not be here when you get back. I apologize. I may not be able to get through this because it's just tough. It's just, it's just hard. It's a two-person team to hold down the fort. And I would love to have life different. 
If you have a child that has something wrong, you as a parent understand you would rather take on all the pain, sorrow, and problems on yourself to be able to get it off your children. You would do whatever that took. But life is not going to change. This is the way it is. And for me, I have to enjoy life the way God has given it to me. And I can't be out there with, well, I want it to be, and I'm not happy with, You have to take the one thing in your hand and take it to you as God has given it to you and appreciate it and value it and be content in it because that's what God has given you. And so often what we have the tendency to do is we waste so much of our life wanting things to be different that are simply not going to change. I'm amazed at how often that happens. You know, well, if you you knew my past, okay. I've got a fun past to tell you, too. We, we, I bet we all have pasts that stink. You know, we could all, you know, line them up in terrible, awful pasts. So are you going to let all of your future be wrecked over the terrible things of the past, or are you just going to take life as it comes to you? Are you going to enjoy, eat, drink, and enjoy life as God has given it to you, or are you going to wreck your future over how difficult things have been in your life? You have a choice on that. And the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, yeah, life is futile. It's a hamster wheel. It can seem pointless and frustrating and empty, but appreciate it as, as what it is. That's the way God made it. Don't look for satisfaction out there. Take what you have and enjoy it. So that's number one. Enjoy life because you cannot make it necessarily what you wish it could be. But God has given this to you in your hand. Going very closely with that, listen to what the writer of Ecclesiastes says in chapter 9, because I think it really underscores it. Chapter 9, verse 11. Again, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, or the battle to the strong, or bread to the wise, or riches to the discerning, or favor to the skillful. Rather, time and chance happen to all of them, for certainly no one can know his time like a fish caught in a cruel net, or like birds caught in a trap, so people are trapped in an evil time as it suddenly falls on them. I, I really love this, this picture that, that is given to us here. <laughs> what a picture that he says. I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift. Have you experienced that? Have you seen that? Have you noticed that the people who get the promotions are not the best workers? Do you know that the people who get ahead in life are not typically the ones that you'd go, yeah, they deserve that? Have you noticed how often the swift don't win? How often the battle is not to the strong? How often the, be- the bread is not to the wise? How often do we look at those things and go, that's not fair? That's not right? Well, what is going on? And here he's making that observation and saying, yeah, that's the way life is. You're right. You can put in all the effort and all the time and still not win the race, still not win the battle, still not obtain the bread. Even though you've put all of that time, effort, you have your wisdom, your speed, and your strength, all of your abilities at play. And he says, and even at that, you may not get there because that's the way God made it. So what is he trying to tell us with that? Well, I think a very similar point. You need to enjoy life as God has given, it, given to you because life is not going to be fair by our definitions. The writer of Ecclesiastes just told us life will not be fair. Now, I don't like that. Sometimes I think I'd feel better if the race was always given to the swift. That makes sense. <laughs> At least I would understand But we even have Proverbs that speak about that, you know, how the tortoise beat the hare somehow. We even understand that life is not going to be fair, that it's not always going to work out that way. Life is not going to be fair by our definitions. Promotions will not always be given to the best. Justice is not always given to the innocent. The race of life is not always given to the strong or the swift. And the underlying question is, so why would you pursue the wind? If you understand this truth that life is going to not be fair and the race is not always given to the swift, 
then why do you live life as if it does? It's not going to pay off. The swift don't always win. All of your effort may not come out. It's not going to happen. That's the way God ultimately made life. He even goes on to say disaster suddenly falls upon us all. He said, now, again, you're being depressing. Where's the hope in all this? Here's the hope. Please focus on what you have. Please focus on what you have. The reason why that's so important is you'll note when he gets out to chapter 7, he's going to give this really wonderful, heart-lifting, encouraging declaration, we're all going to (laughs) die. He he spends an awful lot of time saying, no, none of us are getting out of here alive. I know that's, we like to not think that way. We're all on a clock. (laughs) And we're not getting out of here alive. No one is escaping death. So that means appreciate what you have today. Appreciate the people in your life today. Appreciate the relationships that you have today. Appreciate the blessings that God has put into your one hand today. Stop ignoring what is sitting right here in your hand because you're reaching out with two hands. Because there is the big guarantee in life. We're all going to die. And tomorrow is absolutely not promised to us. We don't know that we're, we all assume we're all going to wake up and we're all going to be here tomorrow. And how many times you go, man, I would have done things differently. We play those games. If you knew that one week from today you were going to die, what would you do different this week? We need to live life like that. Stop assuming. Stop taking for granted. Stop reaching for more and enjoy what you have right now. Appreciate it, embrace it, be glad that you have it because it may not be there tomorrow. And that leads to the final one, and that takes you out to chapter 12, but I'm not going to exactly say what you think I'm going to say quite yet because I want you to see verse 1. Verse 1 of chapter 12 is, is fascinating to me. Chapter 12, verse 1, so remember your creator in the days of your youth. Now, don't put a period there. We put put that on a coffee cup and miss what this is trying to tell us. Why? Why do we need to remember the creator in the days of our youth? Notice the rest. Before the days of adversity come, the years approach when you will say, I have no delight in them. (laughs) You need to reach out for God now because there's going to be a time in which life has absolutely soured you. (laughs) What a way to picture life. You notice he says, you know, life is just going to be so easy and grand. He's saying life is going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be fraught with trials. It's going to have all kinds of difficulties. It's going to be really challenging. And so you need to make life about God now because if you don't, as life beats you down over time, little by little, you're not going to care about it. You're not going to want Him. In fact, that's the imagery when you read verses 12 through, I mean, verse 2 through verse 7. When I was younger, I always thought verses 2 through 7 were, were humorous. You know, because there's these great metaphors about, uh, you know, before the, the, the strong men stoop and the women who grind the grain, verse 3, cease because they are few. And here, you know, it's talking about your teeth falling out and your eyes unable to see. It's all metaphors for how your body's going to fall apart. Now that I'm 47, it's not so funny because, yeah, I'm losing my hair and you know, I have to have a large print Bible and I've got all this going on. And I'm going, yeah, I understand now what this is getting at. Uh, things are going to fall apart in your life. Things are not going to get any easier. So grab on to God now. You need him now. This emptiness and futility of life, this hamster wheel that we get put on, if you don't grab onto God now, it's going to be depressing. It's going to be really empty. It's going to make you really challenge. Okay, well, why do I even bother? It's going to put you in some dark places. 
You need God to get you through those times. You need to be grabbing on to him now. That's what all of that imagery is about. That's why he can get to this big conclusion at the end when he just tries to tell us the only place we can ever find satisfaction is in God. That's his big conclusion. I'm going to use a different translation because if you grew up in the pews, you've heard this one a lot. So I think changing up kind of helps break it into our minds a little bit better. He says, after all this, there is one thing to say, have reverence for God and obey his commands because this is all that we were created for. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. And that's how the book of Ecclesiastes ends. The only place that we will find satisfaction is in God. And when you feel empty, when it feels pointless, when you are in those days where you're like, why? Realize God made life this way so that we would be content where we are and seek him for true joy and true satisfaction. God made life this way so that we would look for something beyond here. Remember that line about putting eternity in our hearts? So that it would cause us to seek beyond this place. As we hit emptiness after emptiness after emptiness, unsatisfying, 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 Okay, I thought my iPhone 13 was going to be the thing. Now it's going to be an iPhone 14, so that's going to make me happy. You know, it's going to be the new car. It's going to be the new job. It's going to be the new family. I mean, we, we, people do that. You know, if I just, you know, if I had kids, if I didn't have kids, if I had a different spouse. If, if. Here's the picture. Satisfaction is only in, in, in God. I thought Eric was going to tread on my final text. He kind of did a little bit. He talked about the Samaritan woman. And I'll end with what Jesus said to her. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Here's Jesus saying, you keep seeking after all these other things. But if you knew who I was, you would understand that I'd give you the satisfaction you need. And to me, that just beautifully fits right in with the picture of what Eric talked about earlier. Here's God offering you streams of living water, rushing to give you the satisfaction you need. Enjoy what's in the one hand. Appreciate what God has given you. Realize that the pursuit is not going to be satisfying. Satisfaction can only be found in God. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, oh Lord, forgive us for how often we try to find our joy and lasting satisfaction in the things of this world. And Lord, I pray that you would help us always to see that true joy true life, true happiness, true satisfaction can only come from you. And everything that we have here in this world is given to you, given to us by you. So Lord, thank you for the blessings that we enjoy. And Lord, forgive us for not appreciating what is in our hands. Forgive us for not being content with the life that you have given to us. Lord, that, thank you for all that you have given us. Thank you for the relationships we have. Thank you for the time that we have been given. Thank you for the uh, 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 crazily abundant rich blessings you've given us. Thank you for this relationship that we have with you. Thank you for our jobs. Thank you for everything that we have. Help us to always be joyful in what we have, to stop seeking after more, but to just simply appreciate where we are with you. Lord, help us to enjoy the one hand with quietness. And Lord, may we always be a thankful and grateful people because we know you have rescued us, you have redeemed us, you have forgiven us, and you have given us so much to enjoy in the short time that we are here. 
Help us to always seek our lasting joy in you and in you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody.